here. Please grab your seats. We're going to move on. So it's a pleasure for us to share this uh, talk. This is jointly a talk joint with the Ikfo Unam School on the Frontiers of Light, together with the Foro Académico del Cefata. And this is why I'm lending the presentation to Miguel here. Thank you so much. Hi, good morning. Um, it's a pleasure to introduce Professor Nick Van Holst. Hope I have pronounced it good. Uh, from the Institute of Ciencias Photonicas, Barcelona, who is our next speak, in, invited speaker in the Foro Académico del Cefata, which in this occasion was also a relevant speaker at the ICFO UNAM International School on the Frontiers of Light. Here, I will present you a brief profile of his academic history and main achievements. Uh, following his study in astronomy and physics, he obtained in 1986 his PhD in molecular and laser physics at the University of Nijmegen in the Netherlands on microwave laser double resonance molecular beam spectroscopy. He made then research in nonlinear optics of organic materials, integrated optics, atomic force and near field optical microscopy and got since 1997, full professor position at MESA Institute of Nanotechnology in the University 20 in the Netherlands with focus on single molecule detection and scanning probe technology. In, in 2005, attracted by the Catalan, Catalan quality based science policy, he became I CRIA, I pronounce this way, a research professor and senior group leader at the ICFO within the Barcelona Institute of Science and Technology. He was head of academic programs and is now chair of the ICFO Nano Fabrication Laboratory. In 2003, he was recipient of the Corber European Science Award. Uh, he was recipient also of the City of Barcelona Prize in 2010 of the European Physical Society Prize in 2017, and has also obtained ERC advanced grants in 2010, 2015, and 2021. His current research interest is to control light interactions at the nanometer scale. To this end, this, his group specializes on optical antennas with nanoscale hotspots and on coherent control schemes to command light on the femto nanoscale. Uh, they study individual molecules, quantum dots, and single proteins in strong uh, interaction with nanotina cavities and sub-10 femtoseconds pulses, uh, controlling excitation emission rates, direction, spectra, polarization, single photo, Finally, uh, this group focused particularly on transport and coupling in single light harvesting antenna complexes at na native conditions to unravel the efficiency and robustness of energy conversion in such natural molecular antennas. Well, uh, Professor Van Hoss will present uh, his talk, uh, Nature and Photosynthesis Lessons for Physicists. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for the uh, very kind introduction. Indeed, my, my current research activity has a lot to do with uh, photosynthetic systems. And so that's why I would think I would, would be good to focus on that today and yeah, now after talking more about historic educational things earlier this week. So nature and photosynthesis lessons for physicists. I, I'm a physicist. Actually, I was in Nijmegen studying astronomy originally from astronomy, if you do astronomy, actually you do a lot of mathematics and physics, and then you do astrophysics, and then astronomy became astrophysics, and in the end, I think I'm just a physicist in the end, but astronomy has my, my heart, that, that, that I can tell you. On the other hand, photosynthesis is the other end of the spectrum, and that's where I'm now, so life can get you at funny directions. 
And of course, yeah, I'm still Nick van Huls working at ICFO as an ICREA professor and all that. And you heard a lot about ICFO. ICFO, I think I'm, I'm, I'm one of the best decisions of my life was actually to go to ICFO and make ICFO work at ICFO and all that. And ICFO is good. ICFO has about 25 research groups. I have, have a lot of PhD students, a lot of postdocs, and it's a very vibrant environment, actually. Good. So let's go to the point. So you were introducing me. And indeed, I was born in 1957. And I did my school, high school here. I did my PhD here. I went to be a career professor at ICFO here. And today we are here. This interesting curve is because it shows the CO2 in this world. And if as the Earth is having a northern and a southern hemisphere with lots of green stuff, and it breezes winter, summer, winter, summer. And you see the CO2 goes up and down and up and down every year. You can see the years. I lived all those years. Good. But you also see that the baseline is going up, of course. When I got born, it was around 310 ppm. Some years ago, we had all the celebration of reaching the 400 limit in 2015. Today, we are at around 420. And the slope is actually as high as it has been recently. And when I was at was born, it was only four times lower. So we're doing pretty good on this curve in going up. And of course, this is the, the main problem of today. The climate change is largely having this as a basis and we should do something about it. And so actually at ICFO, although we are a photonics place and we have a lot of quantum optics and nanophotonics research, we also have a very special program called the Clean Planet Program, where we're trying to address this topic. We actually have at the moment six groups at ICFO. One is the group of Pelayo Garcia Darquer doing CO2 mitigation, so really directly trying to attack this problem. The group of Jordi Martorey doing organic nanostructured photovoltaics. The group of Gerasimos Constatatos, he works on, on, on materials to do light-induced current generations. Georgia, who does a lot on thermal design of materials. And then, of course, here today are present Nicoletta Liguori and myself. And we're very active on the photosynthetic part of this. And so Nicoletta gave a talk. I gave a talk here earlier, so you know more or less where we stand. And both of us, we, of course, address this year. Yeah, so this is uh, the largest energy conversion process on Earth, which is the green material. Nicoletta talked about it. I'll talk about it. And of course, this morning we had Jacqueline also very, very strongly addressing this topic. This is an important topic. And we can learn a lot and a lot and a lot on nature here because nature has had an enormous time to optimize this process. And the design has been evolutionary and it's actually, I'm a physicist and every time I start understanding more on this process, I'm kind of stunned and surprised how well nature has designed things to work so well. And we're still in the process of understanding that. It's a beautiful system as a physicist to look at actually. And of course it's super relevant. So photosynthesis needs light. Huh? If you go deep in the ocean, it's pretty dark, like a few thousand kilometers, a few thousand, yes, kilometers. It, it is that deep and it, it can be really, really dark. Yet, if you go very deep and you look carefully, there is a bit of light. I mean, it's about 10 to the minus four watts per square meter, a few hundred photons per second at that level. And if you go there, there are actually animals around there still, well, animals, bacteria. And the green sulfur bacteria is actually one of those bacteria that managed to stay alive at these very, very, very low levels below the sea. At these light levels, it has a replication about four to 28 days. And with these very few photons, it managed to do it. Wow. Yeah, so it's, it's a super efficient system. If you go into the details of the green sulfur bacteria, you see that indeed, down into it it has a huge antenna complex the chlorosome which tries to capture any photon that might be there assemble all these photons all these photons have to go back to this basal plate under here where there is a complex it's the, the so-called fmo complex it was in, discovered by fena matthews and olsen and therefore it's called fmo and this is a complex that funnels in the end this energy of all these photons towards reaction centers where things get then converted into 
into energy carrying material like ATP. And this system does it well. It has almost 100% efficiency, really. Then, of course, there are other systems, like, for example, not the green, but the purple bacteria. If you go to the purple bacteria, you find them in this kind of in ponds, where you go like the water looks a bit pinky, purplish, and it's because these guys are there. And also there, you might wonder how does it work there. Well, if you go to the surface of these guys, to the membrane, and you try to zoom into that, you get very high resolution images if you manage to do that. Now, here is an image of a purple bacteria membrane by AFM, atomic force microscopy, and the scale is 20 nanometers. Now, this is not done really directly on the bacterium because that's impossible. But so what people do, they get the membrane, they kind of purify, they reconstitute, and then they try to keep things as biologically relevant as possible. And then you make it on a substrate, and then you can get these kind of images. So how much the biological treatment has changed the reality to what we see here, we don't know exactly, but this gives a good idea of what it looks like. And what you see here, you see all kinds of circles of antenna complexes. So for example, we can try to zoom into one. So this is an antenna complex that has several chromophores where the light gets in. And then the light actually might go to another one and to another one. And at some point it hits a big complex where in the middle there's the reaction center and that has the purpose to do the charge separation. And after the charge separation, we get actually the, the, the synthesis of, of energy. So try to look at it a bit more in detail. So you have a reaction center surrounding by a light harvesting antenna complex, which is called the LH1. And this is again surrounded by other complexes, the LH2s, and the light gets in. So there is a huge sea of antennas around it and they all assemble the light that goes to the reaction center, which then does the turnover of the charge separation. So you absorb light, you transfer to the LH1, charge separation, and then there is a reduction of quinone. Then then there's a photon gradient across the membrane, which makes it in the end, you can synthesize ADP. This is the understanding of it. And if you try to look at the details, you can get sometimes AFM images, and you get these images of the LH1 with the reaction center and the LH2 as it is. And if you start counting here, you actually see nine blobs. There are nine chromophores in that system on this image. Go one level deeper. We actually get to the, the molecular structure. So this system is an iconic system in photosynthesis because already in the 90s, Richard Cocteau was the one who managed to, to crystallize it and get X-ray diffraction out of it and get the full structure. And this is why we know of this particular system pretty well what it looks like. And you see that indeed the LH2 has one, two, three, four, five, six, and nine chromophores. But actually in reality, it consists of two rings. And the second ring has twice nine chromophores. So it's twice nine is 18 plus nine is 27 chromophores. And these two rings have transfers between each other. Then you can go to the next ring, which is more or less identical. And then it goes to the big ring, the LH1, where there is here the reaction center. And you see that this is like one picosecond. This is like five picosecond, 35 picosecond. So there is like a gradient in speed in going there. Then of course, if you actually go look at these systems in reality, purple bacteria, there is a zoo of those guys. So if you go into the waters and you look higher in the water, lower in the water, at different kinds of conditions, you see actually that depending on where you go, you find that the spectrum of these guys can be quite different. And it's all like some purple bacteria species, but in that family, the spectrum can be a bit more to the blue, can be a little bit more to the red. And you also see that actually it has usually this double feature because the, this LH2 ring has double ring and one has a bit shifted spectrum compared to the other. And here we come to one of the beauties of nature that if you try to think as a physicist about it, you have all these chromophores, which are actually bacterial chlorophylls. These bacteria, bacterial chlorophylls, as a physicist, you say, okay, you have a ground state, you have excited state, fine. But if you put two together, they get coupled and when you have two dipoles coupled, we know that because of the coupling, you get a split. You have an excitonic system. And so if you have initially one transition, you actually get two transitions, and the split has to do with the amount of coupling. 
And depending on whether these dipoles are parallel or anti-parallel, it's the upper state or the lower state that's allowed. And here, usually the kind of parallel, the lower state is allowed. So you get a bit of a redshift. And if you look in this system, there are all these bacterial chlorophylls. They're in the, in the fundamental LH2 system in the upper ring and in the lower ring. They're also in the LH1. There's all these bacterial chlorophylls. But now what nature does, it tunes the coupling such that it can tune the redshift. So it's all the same molecule, it's the same Lego block, but by combining them cleverly, you can, you can, can, into the, can go through the spectrum. So what you see, while well, increasing the coupling, you first are at this single band where the things are quite isolated, and because they're quite isolated, they're not much redshifted. Then you go to the other, the lower band, that's, they are double dimers, and because each of them is coupled, you see that actually you have a redshift from 800 nanometer to 850 nanometer. Then if you go to this LH1, it has a ring where again, the coupling is a bit stronger and it actually is 875 nanometer. So you see, you go down to the reaction center. So this, this, this purple bacteria knows the physics very well. It has a reaction center surrounding by some chromophores that are pretty redshifted, less redshifted, less redshifted. So the photon comes in, it sees an energy landscape down towards the reaction center. You have to go there. Back is not energetically not okay. That's also why the speed is going from fast to slower and slower and slower. So that's very interesting. And so this exciton engineering in nature is, is for me, quite, quite surprising. Of course, then as a physicist, you say, oh, if you have all this excitonic control and all that, is there also some coherence perhaps? We'll get to that topic later. Good. So after a bit of introduction, I want to address a few points. So try, let's try to stay systematic. So four points. I want to tell you that we still use plasmonic antennas to enhance to look at these guys. Then I want to go into ultra fast experiments on these guys. Then I want to do some imaging and tracking on how can you see this energy go. And the last thing is actually, can we also detect the charges that are generated in these systems? Good. So I already told you a few times about this iconic LH2 pro system, which has its 27 chromophores, but actually in an upper ring, which has nine and a lower ring where it has two times nine. And the spectrum of this guy is on the on the blue side, and this spectrum of this guy is a little bit more on the red side, and you also have a bit of emission. And of course, this is a hugely complex system. So if you look at the spectroscopy, these lines are a bit broadened because the exact conformation of the thing can be a bit different from one to the other to the other complex. If you want to study them, you want to get through all this inhomogeneous broadening, it's good to look at as few as possible, best a single one. That's actually what we're trying. So, come on. So what we're trying to do is so we take this, this LH2 complexes, we put them on a surface, we put them in an ambient with a water-based polymer, PVA, such that they're biologically relatively happy. And then you can dis spread them. So here you see a fluorescence of every LH2. And indeed, you can detect them. So here you see what I showed you earlier this week, the detection of LH2, and at some point it bleaches. And they tend to blink, and they tend to go up and down in signal, and usually they die pretty fast. So the fluorescence of these guys you can detect. But of course, actually, they're not made to fluoresce. They are made to absorb the light and move it around and get to the next ring, to the next ring, to the next ring. So any fluorescence I see is actually a lost channel. It's bad. News. That's why the quantum efficiency of these guys is, 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 is like 10%, 5% in that ballpark. It's low. So it's a very bad system to look at at a single molecule level because you're actually you're looking at the thing that you shouldn't do. On the other hand, if you want to look at a single one that has a low quantum efficiency, and you're a physicist, you say, ah, oh, I should get the quantum efficiency up. I can see it better, I can study more of it. And then although I'm doing a bad thing to it, biologically speaking, from a physics point of view, it's handy to be able to look at them. And I told you this week earlier that with all these antennas, you can actually get more light of it out of it. So it's an obvious thing to think directly like, ah, you know what, what I'm gonna do? I'm going to use plasmonic particles, like a rod in a certain length, and I put this LH2s on top, and let's see whether I get more. 
So what you do, you make like nano rods, you, then you go like, oh, the nano rod should be resonant with this biological complex. So the nano rod should perhaps be short, should perhaps be long. So you make a series of nano rods with different lengths. And then you put on top of it your PF PVA polymer with its LH2 in it. And then you do an experiment with the short to long, and you look at the fluorescence, and at a certain length, it seems to like it better than at other lengths, but you get more light out of it. And if you want to understand that, it's because if you look at the spectrum of the LH2, it's around 800, 850 nanometer. These plasmonic particles, depending on their length, they go from the blue to the red. And so if you tune over it at some point, hmm, 160 nanometers seems to be more or less right, and that's indeed where you get an enhanced signal and you quantify that, you see this enhancement at a certain length of this antenna. But that makes you very happy. This experiment that was done by Emily Winches, who is a, quite an expert of photosynthesis and running her own group at the moment in Wageningen in the Netherlands, but she's actually the one that got this to work. Now, the good news is that it's enhanced, but the bad news is actually, okay, this is one and this is six. Six times. That's okay. But it's not shocking. So why is that? Mm -hmm. Now, if you're physicists and think about these antennas, you know actually that these antennas, the most of the field enhancement is at the ends. And if you put this LH2 all over the place, it'll get enhanced, but many of them at the wrong position, so they don't get enhanced very much. So that's not a good thing to do. So you should actually do it a little bit better. And that's what Emily did. So she said, you know, we need actually to have this antenna, but we need to put the guy at the end of the antenna and not just all over the place. So she did that. And then it gets interesting. So if you look at the LH2 randomly, not on an antenna, you have a certain brightness. Then you go to an array of antennas. And here we took the right length, 160 nanometer. And now we're looking at a very low concentration of, of, of complexes. And you see that the signal is six here and it's 6,000 there. Choop. We go up enormously. Now, if you look at time traces of these molecules, you see that yeah, they have a certain amount of fluorescence, they blink and all that. But then if you go to on the antenna, again, it's up several hundred times. Also here it's up several hundred times. So this is great. The antenna gives you an enormous amount of extra signal, typically up to 500 times. And the quantum efficiency is actually going up from below 10% to 55%. So you excite them better and you emit better, both. So here you gain a lot. I should tell you that Emily did this, but then you wonder, how did she get these LH2s at the end of the antenna? She did not. What she did, she just put a very low concentration so that there is very few molecules on each antenna. And on each antenna, where there happens to be one at the end, it's enhanced 500 times, it's completely dominant. And that's why actually it looks like single antenna responses, but most of the antennas have like, happen to have one at the end, luckily, but some antennas not, and they look much darker actually. So it's a, it's a game of just making the physics do its job and optimizing by itself and being lucky that you actually get this. So this is very nice. And if you have a physicist, you, you like this. Eh? So you think, okay, I have like a fluorescent lifetime of this LH2 when it's just free. It decays with something like nanoseconds. If you put it on the antenna, it goes a lot shorter. If you put it exactly at the right position of the antenna, it goes again shorter. And so here you see for many antenna complexes, the lifetime goes from a thousand picoseconds, one nanosecond can go down and we can get it down to something like 20 picoseconds. So very, very fast fluorescence photons coming out. And while the lifetime goes down, the enhancement goes up. And so here are the record cases, 500 times with 20 picoseconds. That, that's of course nice. On the other hand, you're, you're really teasing this complex a lot. Because, I mean, it should do transfer uh, around the ring into another one. And now I'm making all the photos going out through the antenna. So I'm, I'm really disturbing this system enormously. Huh? But you have a lot of light. If you have a lot of light, 
so much that you can actually look at the photons coming, you can do photo statistics. And I was telling you earlier that if you look at photon statistics and you look at when are the photons coming and when not, you can look at the correlation between the photons. And here I show you the second order correlation function of the photons coming from this LH2 complex. And we can do that because we get an enormous amount of signal. And we see that we have a pulsed laser and because there is a pulsed laser, the correlations are more or less when the laser pulses are. But we see we never have correlation at time zero. So you never get two photons at the same time from this LH2 complex. So it anti-bunches. Hmm. Earlier to this week, I told you on something anti-bunches, it's a proof that you have a single photon source because we had a single molecule, a single quantum dot. Here, we get a single photon source, which is a non-classical emission of a 27 chroma four complex. That shouldn't be, or should it, or what? And so we're going here to the this, this case, like you have this very, very, very big chromophore with this 27, a complex with 27 chromophores, and it acts like a single photon emitter. So people are in the quantum side, like, whoa, this is very cool quantum effect, and there might be some very strong excitonic coupling. That's why it's so coherent, and it looks like a single photon source. But we know that that's not the case because they're not completely strongly coupled all along the ring. So what's happening here? Why can it still look like a single photon source? Actually, it's much simpler. I mean, a photon comes in and it hits a certain chromophore and it transfers to the next and the next. But all these chromophores have a little bit of energy and it will hop around to the lowest energy one. And that one will emit. There is always the lowest energy chromophore here. And as long as that light comes out fast enough compared to what I drive in, it looks like a single photon source because it's just so much coupled that it's always the same guy emitting. So it tells you it's a coupled system. It doesn't tell you whether it's coherent or incoherent. It just tells you it's fast enough to, to look like this. So that's what's going on here. But it's very interesting eh? because you, you get these funny photon statistics even out of such a biological system. Then we started to say, okay, but perhaps our antenna made this to happen. So after we saw this with the antenna, we said, okay, let's get the thing, the antenna away. We have very low signal. We still did photon counting and photon statistics and on many LH2 complexes, we put all the photon correlations together. And so out of many singles, not on antenna, we created this graph. And again, there is this anti-bunching. So it also happens in the free LH2, not only on the antenna. Good. That makes us very happy. Of course, you can now also go to, to other relevant systems. For example, if you go to the green bacteria, I told you before, there is this FMO complex, which is very important in this channel in the high efficiency of the green bacteria to get to the reaction center. And this FMO complex is actually, if you look at it, it actually is a trimer. It has three complexes and each of those three complexes by themselves, again, consists of eight chlorophylls. And the FMO is, 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 is a very efficient system. It also means it's very, not very lossy. It hardly fluoresces. If you look at the FMO with a fluorescence microscope, you can actually not see a single because the quantum efficiency is below 1%. You cannot. That's good news for the biological function, bad news for the physicists who want to look at them. But then again, we thought, okay, we should be able to, to get this guy visible. So again, we made an antenna array. We put this FMO complexes on top. And again, you see that if you have the lengths right, here you see the fluorescence, you actually can see FMOs. And again, you see you need to have the right lengths. It's a bit shorter here because the wavelength is a bit different, but you get a resonance. And this is the work of Jana Ochkova in my group. And then of course, you have to also put them again at the right position and all that. So she did that. And to make a long story short, we saw again fluorescence lifetime shortening. And again, it anti-bunched, even this FMO. So it's a trimer of eight chlorophylls, eight chlorophylls, eight chlorophylls. And apparently the thing is enough coupled still to look as a single photon source, although you have three times eight is 24 chlorophylls. But then again, it does this sometimes. 
We also saw often that actually did not antibodies. It was sometimes yes, sometimes no, sometimes yes, sometimes no. It was a bit strange. And so then we started to measure the fluorescent lifetime and it could be shorter and shorter and shorter. And here I put a correlation on how deep this dip is. So this at time zero, the second order correlation function can go from one to zero. And here is how fast the decay is. I look at how much the short component is important. So if it's very fast or very slow, you see actually that if it's not too fast yet, it's very much anti-bunching. But if it gets faster and faster and faster, this anti-bunching actually goes away. Hmm. So this antenna coupling is strong and weaker. And so what you see actually that if the antenna is doing not too much, somehow these three complexes there can emit by themselves. It looks more like a three emitter. Whereas if I make the whole thing really go very fast, it looks like a single emitter. And this has to do with the fact that the transfer times between these three and the complex is in the order of 30 picoseconds. And so what you see, this antenna is now competing with the transfer inside the complex. If the antenna enhances, but not too much yet, this transfer in the complex is still dominant and you have like, like a single emitter. But then if you make the thing going faster and faster and faster, you, at some point you get faster than the 29 picoseconds, then the antenna gets dominant over the transfer. And this is the transition you see here. So you have a competition between what you do externally with your antenna, transfer to the antenna, and transfer inside the complex. And you see these two things happening here. So we got here a first insight into transfer inside these guys by antenna manipulation and doing it soft, subtle, or more, more strong. Now, of course, as we talk about picosecond transfers, looking at it with antennas is a kind of very indirect way, although at least you get fluorescence so that you can detect something that's good. But of course, the thing you should really do if you want to know fast transfer on these systems, you should take femtosecond laser and do pump probe and hit these molecules, the FMO or the LH2 or another one, and try to see really ultra fast which dynamics you get. And this is what people have been doing a lot on ensembles of these systems. Here we're trying to do it at the level of a single. Can you do that? Well, why not? Let's go ultra fast. Yeah. So we have this uh, LH2 ring, for example, which exists of two rings and there's transfer in the order of a couple of picoseconds. And we want to see that. And in the spectrum, it has this one ring. It, it is in the 800 nanometer and the other one 850. And can we see the transfer, for example, from one to the other and do an experiment on that? And to do that, the only thing you need to do is if you look at single molecules and you have a single molecule microscope, inside your microscope, you should now start exciting with femtosecond pulses. And not only femtosecond pulses, but multiple pulses of which you can delay the time and also the phase between these pulses. So we did that. So we take a very fast laser, 40 femtosecond laser. We take a pulse shaper that can make all these pulses, make sure that the pulses are short, that we control the delay, and also that the pulses are phase related with each other still. And you do that experiment. So here is an experiment on the LH2, on single LH2, where we say we take a laser, which excites on the blue side, the 800 nanometer with the pump. And then at some point later, it excites the other band, the 850 band with the other pump, which then we might call probe. And if there is transfer, you should see that if you pump up here and there's transfer to there, and then you pump up here, there should be some interference of these two, and you can probe the fluorescence and see what you get. That's what we did. And then we did that as a function of delay time, looking at the fluorescence of this system, we got kind of a certain amount of fluorescence, and there were oscillations. And this is 200 femtosecond period, and it goes on about, well, the measurement is up to almost 500 femtoseconds. Another one. And of course, this is a bit weird. This is also why I asked earlier this morning to Joaquin, hey, this is room temperature. At room temperature, everything is dephasing very rapidly. 
typically 10, 20, 30 femtoseconds. That's, that's here. And here you see 10 times longer oscillations. That shouldn't be. It's a, something coherent going longer than anything at room temperature should do in these kind of systems. So it's weird. We did a lot of these measurements. So here you see many single LH2s. Like you see that it differs from complex to complex because they have slightly different conformation. The spectrum is a little bit shifted compared to exactly where you're excited with your laser. So, but then actually, if you look at all of them, they're different. And if you do the experiment at the ensemble, you see actually it's just flat. So it's important to look at a single to have the conformation well-defined and, and really get these coherent oscillations out. So this was very interesting at the time. So this is uh, 2013, 10 years ago by now, yeah? In those days, people were very keen on coherences in these systems. And actually the moment you publish this, immediately people jump onto you. So for example, we got this. And so the BBC, plants, seen doing quantum physics. Poof, this is the BBC. We were actually measuring on bacteria. But detail, detail, you know, they say plants. <laughs> So these things happen, yeah? And of course, uh, quantum physics is used to harvest light more efficiently has received the boost. We just see oscillation. I didn't see anything about efficiency or anything like that, but this is where it gets done then put. And of course, this at those days felt into actually a boom. There were more experiments. In those days, there was the famous experiment of Greg Engel from Berkeley, who did on the FMO complex in an ensemble. He saw this oscillations, and also the group of Ring van Grondelle in Amsterdam. There was Elisabeth Romero who showed oscillations of the photosystem too. So these oscillations were seen and it was, it was very spectacular. By the way, if you are a physicist and you look at the data that Mr. Gret Engel had, these are the data points. Would you dare to put that oscillatory curve there or would you put a flat line? I mean, <laughs> but he got it into nature. Wave-like energy transfer. So this was really hype, yeah? So in those days, also Philip Ball, this is one of these fancy writers for nature, the dawn of quantum biology. Now this, we're now 10 years further on. Our oscillations have intrigued people a lot, a lot of years, actually. But in the end, we got to collaborate with Martin Plenio's group. And Martin Plenio, he put Felipe Caicedo on it to do some good theory. And Felipe said, okay, let's take the LH2. We look at all the excitonic states. He looked at the, the 800 nanometer band and the 850 nanometer band. And he looked at a two dimensional pattern at the importance of all the couplings that you could have at between, between the different excitonic states in the system. And so he did that. And he came out with actually a model where he said, yeah, you know, you excite it on the blue and then on the red, and then it should interfere. That's what you think you did. But actually what you did, you were sitting all the time in the red band. And in the red band, you didn't excite to the first state, but you just excited to a higher excitonic state. And then the blue one also came into that band. You could even dump that one down. And then you have dynamic up there, all in the B850 band. And if you do some calculations on the excitonic dynamics in the 850 band only, you get this kind of oscillations. And so he could reproduce kind of our data by just saying, I have excitonic coupling in the B850 band. I have to put, he did put a lot of vibrational dynamics into it. And then he could simply explain this. And the fact that it's going longer than you would think is simply because vibrations go on a model much longer than electronic coherences do. So you could kind of explain it. And this makes, of course, that if you get this explanation, you say, okay, it's just vibrational dynamics and there is no quantum coherence for energy transfer, at least not in our data. And this is actually the knowledge more or less today that although there has been a hype on, on bio quantum things, so far there are no experiments that show that any quantized coherence can do anything good on any transfer on these photosynthetic systems. But of course, if it would be true, it would be nice. But so far, there is no proof at all on that. Okay, good. Where are we now? 
I showed you something on antennas. I showed you something on ultra fast. And um, yeah, there is actually interesting physics behind all these things. That that's what I like about it. But of course, there is now. We have been looking at these single rings, but actually there is this this, this huge network. How does this light now go there? Yeah. And so if you look at reality, there is a lot of, of varia variation on how these light harvesting complex networks look. Sometimes they're very ordered. Sometimes they're semi-ordered. Sometimes they're pretty chaotic and it's com completely disordered. And you see that this, so this is all on the bacterial membrane. These are all AFM images of systems that come from different growth conditions, different preparation conditions and all that. So it can be like nicely almost crystalline to complete disorder. Mm -hmm. Same thing is also if you go to the plant system, also there you see AVM images of the, this grana. And if you go into it, there is some structure, but actually in practice, the thing looks very, very disordered. And so if you wonder about a photon coming in, how it actually would reach the reaction center, that's not so easy because it depends a lot on which system you look at how many chromophores are in this ring, how close they are packed, whether they rotated or not with each other and all that. So one of the things that, that I'm trying to study is like, if you have such a system, the photon comes in, the photon goes to the reaction center, what's the pass it takes? And if it takes a pass, is it Brownian diffusion or is it directed diffusion or what is it? And can you quantify that? And can you look at the number of steps and the step size and the direction and all that? And if we know that this is a downhill energy transfer, can you spectroscopically see that it actually does go downhill and that it kind of goes from fast to slow? And is it, how is it connected to this network? Is the network like hexagonal or cubic or disordered or what? Yeah. And people who look at transport in systems, physicists, they usually say, okay, if you do that, you just measure the trajectory, and you plot as a function of time, the mean square displacement on how it goes. And if you do that and you get a straight line, then it's just Brownian diffusion. If it goes down here, you have sub diffusion and it gets kind of limited somewhere, but you also have cases of super diffusion, ballistic things, or perhaps something that has a two component and all that. So we would like to study that. That's a good idea, but this image is smaller than the wavelengths of light. So it's, it's easy in PowerPoint to draw this line, but to measure it, that's another story because you need very high resolution, super resolution. Maria told us, well, you can do super resolution. So you label it and then you might see how things go. But here the photon and the exciton goes. I cannot label an exciton. Because the whole thing is photonically active. So to do this, everything is photon active. So you need real resolution. So what do you do? Well, yeah. So then, of course, you get inspired by the super resolution people. The super resolution people, they say, oh, you know, it's not a problem. You have a microscope. It has a point spread function. And then you have perhaps a molecule a bit on that side and a bit of molecule on that side. You just fit the positions. And when you fit it very well, you can see how much they separated. That's the super resolved fluorescence microscopy. Then, actually, if you put light on some, some, some surface, of course, the spot size will be diffraction limited. But if you let time go and there is diffusion and light goes somewhere, the spot will widen up in time because, yeah, there is transfer. And although there is a diffraction limit, if you measure very well this response function and also how much it widens up, you can still measure that with a much higher accuracy than the diffraction limit. You just need to see how much this spot changes. And that means that the precision of the width measurement can be far beyond the diffraction limit, and it's just determined by the signal to noise ratio. But this is actually an interesting concept. It's connected to super resolution in a way. It has been explored over the last five to 10 years, first by Li Bai Huang, and William Tills at MIT, also people in Berkeley and all that. So we're on that. And that means that, okay, now let's look in space. Yeah? So for example, I show here a diagram where you see a diffraction limited spot. But this diffraction limited spot, you see it because I go on a piece of gold and on that piece of gold, I do pump probe. I 
pump it up with one color and I probe with the other one. So as I try to show you here, you have a pump and a probe and you try to look at that diffraction limited spot. And the pump probe as a function of delay time has a certain contrast and that makes that you see this diffraction limited spot. If I go to negative time delay, there is just nothing. If I go up in time delay, you see that the thing kind of diffuses out, you get less contrast. And if you look at this curve and this curve, and I plot here the one at zero time and the one at 10 picosecond time, they look the same. But perhaps this one is slightly more wider than that one, and then you know how much energy transfer happens. But at first glance, you don't see much, but we build a setup to do that. It was actually Alex Alexander Block in my group, the first one who do that to do that. And so if you now look at this widening of spots, so here you see now time. And here is this diffraction limited spot size. Here is time zero. Initially, there is lots of contrast, and then it goes out. And now you fit very carefully how wide this spot is. And if you plot the Fourier half max square against the time delay, you see that this on just a simple piece of gold, the width goes up very fast initially. And at some point it goes up slower and you can fit a slope and it gives you diffusion coefficient. And here also on this longer part, you can fit and you get a diffusion coefficient. And actually this tells you that gold has first very hot electron transport, and then it has some phononic decay. On gold, these things are known, but here you see them in real space and time. Very nice, you can see that. Uh, so you can, on gold, prove that the system works. Okay, that makes you happy. So then you say, now let's go back to our biological system. Then I talked to my colleague, Neil Hunter in Sheffield, and he can make out of, again, these LH2 things of the purple bacteria, nicely reconstituted membranes. They look almost like crystalline things, very nice membranes. These membranes have a tendency sometimes to curl up, then you get like, like tubes. But now the question is, what's the transfer in this? Of course, this is an AFM image, otherwise you wouldn't be able to see it. If you go to your microscope and you take such a membrane, you see that these membranes are not infinitely large. So here you see flakes of these membranes of LH2 that fluoresce a little bit. And this is a five micron flake. You also see that although it's supposed to be homogeneous, sometimes it kind of flaps into a double layer, sometimes not. So life is not perfect, but at least you have a membrane of an LH2 complex here. And then sometimes also they roll up. So you see such an LH2 tube. And then we said, okay, can we see transport? So you, you excite at a certain point. And then you look after having excited there, what happens? And you see a little bit of an extended fluorescence. So it tells you something is going along this tube because of transport in the LH2 membrane. That's actually nice, you can see that. Although the bad news is of course, that if you do this a little while, in the middle, it bleaches because this is biological stuff and it photo dissociates very, very rapidly. So do you do this experiment and why do the experiment, the thing kind of dies on your hands because it really doesn't like much light on it. But okay, we said, okay, so now let's do the experiment. So this is Julia in my group who was the one trying to look to this nicely crystalline membrane. So you have the membrane and you put your spot somewhere on and you try to see whether your spot widens up. And also, as a function of time delay, you see whether the spot widens up here. Actually, we had a very hard time to see much here. First thing is that if you put a spot on it, the spot has a certain size. And if I try to look at a reference sample, it has 580 nanometer, and with the LH2, it's 630. So it's a bit larger, but actually there was hardly any transport. It was certainly below 25 nanometers. We tried to look at how widening of spots happened. The diffusion was much, much smaller, a very low number, and it was actually hard to measure anything. And the bad thing is that on the fluorescence that came out of it, we measured the fluorescence lifetime. It was below 30 picoseconds. Very, very fast. That's actually way too fast. The, the, the natural membranes have a much longer lifetime. So what happens here is that we work together with Neil Hunter in Sheffield and he made this very nice crystalline membrane, but he overdid it. 
he made it so nice that they're so close together that you have self-quenching between the chromophores and the, 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 the complexes. They have a very fast decay in fluorescence and the light does hardly get anywhere and the spread is less than 25 nanometer. So actually, this would, this would never reach the reaction center if it would be in there, it just doesn't get there. So this is a physicist design of an LH2 membrane overdoing it and trying to make it nicely crystalline. So it should be more disordered. It should be more messy. So, okay, we went back to Neil and say, hey, Neil, make it less nice. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, then Neil and, and Svetlin, postdoc in his group, they, they used um, in, na nano imprinting so that they put layers of LH2 on the surface in a kind of lower concentration. You see some AFM images on it. So there are lines of LH2, also lines of LH2 in fluorescence now. And here you see in, an, uh, in a microscope what these lines look like. And then we measure the fluorescent lifetime on these lines. And this is now a few hundred picoseconds, between 400 and 900 picoseconds. That's much more reasonable lifetime for a natural system to have some transport. Actually, we don't know now, of course, what the organization is because we don't have any resolution in it. And we didn't get AFM inches with, with LH2 resolved yet so far, although we're trying. Okay. Is this any better? Actually, it is. This is Guillermo. He did now the experiment on looking at transport in these guys. And again, we look at the mean square displacement versus time. And now we see actually nice diffusion going on. This is a very low power, power below sun, sun conditions. We can also put the power up above, above sun conditions, and we can follow it longer. We can actually see that the diffusion kind of at some point levels off into a certain area where, where you get asymptotic where you go. Also, this has to do with the fact that at higher power, you get a lot of single sync annihilation and kind of thing is dying by itself. But we got now a real diffusion coefficient. We still got a spread not that high, like about 22 nanometer and a reasonable time. So the numbers we have now are more or less looking to the natural system. And we might be in a point to, to now to try to look at trajectories and all that. Although the light levels are, are very low and it's very hard to get the data. I'm happy that we get so far. And so this is some, some spatial information. Although the real experiment, of course, but I showed you in the beginning is to measure the trajectory. This is all the fraction limited stuff. So I'm still looking at an area on average, how things move out. So it's over many hundreds of nanometers, how on average it goes. I'm not looking locally. So you should do this with near field approaches or so, which we're always also with trying, but so far didn't work much. Good. How are we doing with time? Okay, no? Yeah. Yeah, that's very long. That's very long. Good. So, okay. So we, we looked at enhancement of fluorescence. We looked at ultrafast. We looked at tracking of how well light goes. Now let's look at charges. And why, why do I say that? Well, if you look at all these, these light harvesting complexes, of course, there is this antenna complex and there is a reaction center. And this happens to be so in the purple bacteria LH1, but also in the plant system and all. There's always a reaction center there. And if I'm a photonics guy who likes antennas and the light comes in, the light goes somewhere and look at the fluorescence and I try to see where it goes. In the end, it has nothing to do with the separation of the charge at the end or the generation of ADP. So I can look a lot at antenna transport, but in the end, what the system cares about is charge separation. And actually, if I'm looking at fluorescence, I'm even more stupid because I'm looking at the loss channel. I don't look at where the energy should go. So if you want to do these experiments, you should look at the charge and not look at the fluorescence. But single molecule charge detection, we didn't hear of much yet. So, so difficult. Yeah. So we should look at the charge. So for example, people are in electrochemistry. You say, I mean, you can put voltage on a system, measure a current, and if you put some light on it changes, and then you can do photo-induced electrochemical current detection, these kind of things. So that, that, that's, that's a way to go, perhaps. So that's actually what we have been exploring now. 
So let's go try to look at the charge and not do fluorescence. Here I collaborate with Roberta Croce from the Free University of Amsterdam and also in, in Barcelona with the group of Paul Corestisa, particularly Manuel, who are very skilled on, on electrochemistry. And so together we set up an experiment where we take an electrochemical cell. And here you have the plant photosystem one. It sits with the right direction onto a, with a self assembly monolayer fixed to a gold layer. And then you have an electrolyte and a potential star and you measure a certain current because these guys have a reaction center that does give charge at that site. In the group of Paul Gorostisa, they showed if you do that, you can, for example, look on a gold surface with a scanning tunneling microscope and at some point resolve individual photosystem one units. But that's nice. Eh? So you can see this photosystem one units. And then of course, I'm like, uh-huh, if I can, by tunneling current, detect them, can I now put light on and do ultra fast light and look at energy transfer and still detect the charge. So the best experiment would be to go into the STM with ultra fast pulses and do the pulse control and look with STM and how it would go. Well, that's a bit difficult, times difficult, times difficult, and that means usually it doesn't work. So you, you should go a few steps back to get the experiment done. And also, PhD student wants to get a PhD at some point, and it's a bit over asked that kind of things. So good. So we will start it simple. Yeah? So here is Manuel, PhD student with Paul Gorostitha. So he built that system that I, I showed you before. So now we put it on top of an optical microscope with a little spot where we can put ultra fast pulses in. Then you get some photo induced current up here, and you detect IV curves. And indeed, as I showed you before, the IV curve that you have without the laser and with the laser, they are a bit different. So you can look at photo-induced current coming from such a layer of photosystem one of the plant system. And here is the result. Yeah, so photocurrent, nanoamps. I take a laser, femtosecond laser. I can control the two pulses. I do time delay. You scan the time delay, and the photocurrent goes ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs, and then it goes out. So this looks like ultra fast photocurrent detection on a photosystem. That that's nice. On the other hand, if you're in optics and you do a pulse itself and a delay, it's actually just Fourier transform spectroscopy. You're just doing like a microscope interferometer. So actually, these are nice ultra fast things, but it's at the fringes of the interferometer telling you what the spectrum is. So because this is just linear spectroscopy. So if you do the Fourier transform of this thing, you get out of it the spectrum. So here you see, if you do the Fourier transform, you get like the photocurrent excitation spectrum of the photosystem one. And actually, if you plot on top of that at the same time, the absorption spectrum of the photosystem one as is known, this kind of fits. Yeah, so it's a difficult way to measure perhaps the absorption spectrum, but it's not the absorption. I measure the part of the absorption that gets into current. So the one that goes, that carries, that creates the current. So it's a relevant one. So that, that's nice. And then of course, okay, having this now, you then you want to know the transfer. So you should actually go to one color and another color and then measure the delay between them and then see how much transfer you might get. For that, you need to do Nonlinear spectroscopy, not just linear spectroscopy. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we were setting that up. So this is Luca Bolsonello, who then put a system and not just two pulses, but two pulses and another two pulses, so that you have two pulses to do spectroscopy in and two pulses to do spectroscopy out and have the time delay between the two. And then you might get more information in the spectral domain. So we first tested that, that on just uh, photovoltaic cell, this is a thing that gives current. So you do the scanning around and you do scanning of these pulses, of these pulses, and you see that you can scan one time delay and another time delay. Then you get again these fringes, but now you get them in two directions. Do Fourier transform in both directions. And this gives you now an excitation spectrum and an emission spectrum at a certain time delay between these pulses, in this case, 30 femtoseconds and here 300 femtoseconds. So here you get some information on, on energy transfer because you see that 
input spectrum, output spectrum, and of course the diagonal is the same spectral component, but anything that off the diagonal tells you that I have a certain color in and another color out. So then you look at transport, transfer. And so you see this here. So we, we, we kind of optimized that a little bit. And so we did that actually on a photovoltaic cell made at ICFO in the group of Jordi Maturé. It's one of those fancy high efficiency organic cells. We came on with all our pulses. You measure current, you do this clever spectroscopy now, and you look at input spectrum, output spectrum. And yes, there are certain off diagonal terms here. And so if you take on the diagonal as a function of time, you see that that component goes down in time and this off diagonal term goes up in time. So you see the transfer from that guy to that guy, which is actually transfer, whole transfer inside this photovoltaic cell. So this is proof of concept. You can do current detection with ultra fast pulses and, and look at that. And the nice thing of this method is that everything is, all the pulses are collinear. So you can put it into a microscope. All the pulses can be focused. And so you can do it on some system like a membrane of light harvesting complexes because it fits into a microscope. So that's what we started doing. Here's the same Luca. Here now is this photo system one. And we started doing this clever pulse experiment. And here you see as a function of delay time, how the contrast goes. Here you see the diagonal term and again the diagonal term at a short time and a long time. And actually not much was happening. It's pretty zero. Diagonal term, diagonal term. Hmm. We did a little bit more clever Fourier transform and then we found that there were some vibrational components hidden in these points. But the electronic relevant transport, we actually didn't get. So I show you here, these are the first two dimensional photocurrent spectra on such a system. Very cool. But what you measure is zero. That's not so cool. Hmm. So why is this now? Because if you, if you have a reaction center and you have the antenna complex and it the goes there and you do a lot of ultra fast spectroscopy on the antenna complex, you usually see contrast. You see all the bands in the antenna complexes and you detect fluorescence or absorption or something, it's fine. But now you detect actually the real thing, the current, and it tells you all these dynamics before actually doesn't matter in what the current gets out of there. That's what it looks like that you do very fancy of ultra fast foot, foot photonics on, on the antenna complexes, but the actual access center cannot care less just about how it works. That might be, eh? which is a bit uh, informative, but also after all the story before, it's a bit of a downer. Yeah? That might be. On the other hand, we, we, we're actually thinking about this a lot at the moment. It's also so, that these are multi chromophoric systems and the charge comes out at a very specific unit. And so the, the number of chromophores is very high and they all have to go through the nonlinear spectroscopy. And what you find out is that in the coupling, to get contrast in nonlinear spectroscopy, you need stimulated emission. But it always goes together also with ground state effect, ground state bleach. And because you have multiple, multiple chromophores, it looks like the ground state is much more dominant in this thing than actually the stimulated emission. And it gets kind of compensated. So we think that the method actually and methodology wise might perhaps not even the contrast because the way the method works. We're not sure. We, we're doing some thinking, we're going together with the group of Elisabetta Collini and part of are doing some theory on it. We think that there are reasons why a multi for system, where you have only one system that you read out, the contrast and these things might actually be very low, but we're not sure. This is, this is, this is research, so we are fighting on that. Joaquin, if you have better ideas on this, do your best, because we're actually trying to understand what's going on here and we don't know. Although we can do very fancy experiments, somehow we're missing the point of it. Good. 
but that's such a science. Yeah. So I was telling you a lot of things, and um, always from the physics point of view. And I think indeed in many of these topics there is kind of cool physics on the biological systems. We did learn a few things, but actually many of the questions on the biological system that we had from the beginning is still standing. Good. Of course, again, it's nice to be here, but the ones doing really the work. So this is Luca Bolzonello doing the clever spectroscopy. This is Julia doing this spatial tracking. This is Jana working with the FMO. This is Guillermo doing also this spatial thing, but then in a clever way. This is Joe trying to use 2D materials for current detection and all of that. So good. I'm happy to have been invited here to try to tell you a little bit about my activities. You see, I get some understanding of open ends and perhaps one day later, I might give you more answers on some of the things I was talking to you about. That's it. Thank you. Okay, the presentation is now open for your comments or questions. Thank you, Nick, for Nick the, Paulette. See, <laughs> for the amazing work, really amazing. Uh, I have two questions. The first is on your work on photo-induced charges, the, the last one you were showing. Yeah. Um, I don't understand well, but uh, how does the, how much you are delaying the pulse? Because so you were showing that until, uh, 500 fm to second. So can you scan even longer delays? And do you think that would affect mm -hmm. the comparison of the signal you're looking for or not? And then the second question yeah. later. Uh, so, so the first question on to, I mean, the, the time delay I showed you was pretty short. This is just technical issues because we're talking about four pulses that you need to pulse shape. And they need to be off of all four phase related because of the nature of the experiment. And at the same time, you need enough delay. And so here we here are using programmable optical uh, uh, acoustic um, elements, so acoustic, acoustic optic modulators, which, which have a limit in the delay. You could also take like pulse shapers and, and real delay lines and do it that way, but then the experiment is more involved. So the way we did it now, it had this intrinsic limit because of the AOM that had limited control of the dispersion and therefore for the delay and yeah uh, and the other question is um so the systems for the tracking of uh, energy transfer mm -hmm. what i remember is that all the systems that uh, are doing in sheffield or in leeds these uh, layers they yeah. always have a little degree of aggregation that gives you super short lifetime and doesn't help maybe but uh, uh, are there limits instead of using uh, lipid by layers deposited like I don't know, language blood or something, and then you add the letter harvesting complexes because it was shown in liposomes that there is a threshold in which mm -hmm. they cluster, they do transfer, but they don't aggregate, they don't quench. So actually, the, the, the method I showed you, the latest, the, it is actually going through a surface LB-like approach. So they have that, they can compress it to a certain density and then they pick it up and then they stamp it on the substrate. So this is actually got done that way. And then so the concentration of course, the density kind of controlled, but not perfect. And also you see that the stamping process is, 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 is very regular. So you have areas with higher densities and others still, but it's, 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 a, it's a way to go. But on the other hand, it's also not really a way to go because in the actual real membrane, of course, these rings have a certain orientation. If you put the rings at a random orientation, it's not okay. And as these rings actually have two photo, two, two chlorophyll layers, and if you invert the two and then put the rings together, <laughs> that shouldn't be. So that, there are many, many buts still to these approaches. But if you know a way to, yeah, to, con them. to control the densities better, because this is still looking at the pure LH2, because the next thing is to put a reaction center also into it at a controlled density. And so we're, we're playing with these games towards it, but there is a road to go, yes. Very exciting, thank you. Uh, do the students also have questions? Yes, please. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, at the beginning, uh, I, I heard about uh, 
the reduction of the wavelength as the photon enters in a system. And this uh, makes me think about energy conservation law. Is there this in this system? Or which, which law? Uh, as the photon uh, enters in the system, uh, it reduces its wavelength. Uh, and this makes me think about energy conservation. Uh, uh, the wavelength is related to frequency and this with energy. Uh, where does an extra energy comes from? Is there, I don't know. Mm -hmm. you, you mean in these light harvesting systems where the light goes through? Yeah. Of course, I mean, I mean, there are losses there. Yeah? So, so that gets get lost by heat principally. On the other hand, you see that nature tries to make a gradient, but the gradient is very subtle. It, it's not a very deep gradient. So you go from a wavelength from 800 to 850 to 870 is only 10%. But that's, of course, again, lost because you start initially with photons with a certain color and you end up at a, at a lower energy one. But it gets compensated by the gain of, of efficiency of having so many antenna complexes getting the light there. Okay. Uh, and also you mentioned about a uh, reduction of velocity or an increasing, I, I don't remember, a uh, reduction of velocity of the photon. And this well, made me think about a refractive index in macroscopic media. What could we think about yeah. the refractive index in this system? I mean, I mean, I mean, it is the light energy that goes to the reaction center, but it goes there. To, act, to excited states of chromophores. So this is excitonic, it's an excitonic system. So to think about a photon walking around, okay. that's not the case. It's, okay. it's an excited state of the system. The excited state is carried from the next to the next to the next. And this is how the photon energy in the excited state is carried on that chromophore goes to the reaction center. Yeah? Okay. And so, and, and yeah, of course, refraction in refractive index is, is a different story there. Okay. Also, this is on a scale. You're talking about 20 nanometer, 100 nanometer. Refractive index is a macroscopic thing. So, nah. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Hi, Nick. Uh, okay. yeah. Jacqueline is also there and also Jose Luis. Uh, Jose, go, you go first. You have the mic already. <laughs> Well, my question is about photo-induced charges. It means that, for example, when you measure in, in picoseconds and femtoseconds, only light can measure this kind of speed. In the case of charge, uh, you, you break this uh, mm -hmm. uh, limit. Yeah. Uh, and have you tried to measure, because the, the speed of the charge is different from the speed of the light. This is a more mm -hmm. concept. Yeah. Uh, have you tried to measure the, the, the magnetic force or because you, you have some uh, velocity about the charges? Or have you tried to think about I mean, these kind of measurements? Well, indeed, this, this charge separation in these systems, of course, has a limited turnover rate. And this is way, way slower than all the fem to and picoseconds. I mean, you're really sitting more on the microsecond scales there. It's also one of the reasons why single detection on charge doesn't really work well because it has a very low rate. But then the experiment you do, although you have femtosecond pulses, you do look at an average in time over a certain, I mean, we, we, we have these pulses coming repetitively and we integrate over a certain time because we need a certain amount of charges to do it. So the experiment actually, as we have more like a microsecond time of the turnover, we integrate up to a millisecond to have enough charges to measure some, some peak ramps. <laughs> and that fact that the laser has a high rep rate, it only means that you should not take an enormous power of the laser to get at the limit of this, this, this turnover of the charge. But usually we're still in a linear regime. But so the real, the real, the real experimental time resolution in milliseconds. But as I tune the pulse shaper with delays, while I integrate milliseconds, I can kill when this is any ultrafast experiment is like that. I mean, 
your experiment takes an hour and you get femtosecond time resolution, but you're actually cheating because you don't have femtosecond time resolution really on your lap. It's just that you, you encode your pulses cleverly. Yeah? Mm -hmm. Joaquin. Thank you. Thank you for your amazing talk. It's uh, absolutely jaw dropping, all, all your work for me. Uh, I have another question regarding the photo induced charges. If I saw your slides correctly, you're using iron compounds to sense the redox process. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So is that something that occurs at the surface or is something that you're adding to the complexes, to the LH complexes, or uh, why cannot you use the quinone, hydroquinone? I mean, it's something that happens in electrolyte. So you have a bath and you have a layer of this photosystem, but there is somewhere a probe that looks at the charges in the bath of the electrolyte and it picks up those charges. So it's, it's kind of indirect. So the thing that is local is where the light comes, but then it's a global detection of charges. And of course, the more you would do that closer, the more you might perhaps get higher efficiencies and all that and get more confined. But electrochemistry is an art by itself and nothing is really small in those baths, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. Also, I should say that the pulse that we put on the system is not the refraction limited spot. It's a lot larger. Otherwise, we, we need enough photosystem once to have enough current because the turnover is microseconds and we need enough charge to detect. So this is definitely not at the level of a single photosystem one. Yeah. Okay, so um, nice, thank you. Um, so I have two questions. One of them, so when you were um, trying to, to do this exit on a special tracking in, yeah. in, in that, um, so if I understood correctly, when you had a first system that you, you were not, a system that it was much more order, you, you were not able to essentially see any uh, a sort of transfer, so a special transfer, well, then you went into a more disorder system, then you were able to do those yeah, measurements. Yeah. Now that goes counterintuitive to me because I would expect that the order the system, the longer that you would, the, the longer and then the higher the probability to essentially see um, excitonic special transfer. What you essentially see the opposite and I yeah. don't understand the reason. But this is very true. But the problem is that if you take detect fluorescence and you have a very close system, you have a lot of self quenching. And this makes that the lifetime is, is just 20 or 30 picoseconds. And it makes that the fluorescence you want to detect dies out very rapidly. Whereas if you take it more spaced, the fluorescence lifetime is 10 times longer. And this makes that it, you get much more fluorescence at a longer distance still because we're doing fluorescence detection. But, yeah, but I mean, but you essentially have, so the idea is that you have an excitant and that you have essentially transfer, mm -hmm. special transfer along the system. No. So if your system is strongly coupled, you would expect that to go faster and to actually go over extended special scale. Yeah, if, if you don't have losses because of the proximity, so you have a lot of single signal annihilation going on. So you have all ah. kind and, and fluorescence quenching and that makes that something kills it ah. despite that regular. Okay. So, and this is just something because of course you shouldn't also make it too spaced because then it's also not okay. So your intuition is very okay, but somewhere there is an optimum in these things. Mm -hmm. And probably nature kind of put the distance as such that the quenching is limited but also it's enough close that you still have efficient hopping of the transfer and then yeah. okay okay i see um i have another question can, 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 you, can, can we ask the students first oh. also to to because i don't know what anybody has another one yeah yeah 
at the end of the talk, you talk about non-linear non uh, processes, optical processes. This comes from several, from the uh, different, from the infinite atomic levels or molecular levels of the system. And several transitions can occur between them. But at this uh, scale, maybe uh, macroscopically, we, we neglect, uh, we neglect uh, several level, energy levels, and work with two or three. And uh, at this level, do we need to consider more levels, energy levels, to make these transitions? And <laughs> what what kind of non-linearities uh, occur, or do you expect to occur? Uh, three-way mixing, four-way mixing, and... Yeah, I mean, the, the word non-linear in, in optics, of course, makes you think about chi-2 and chi-3 and all kind of second harmonic and things affects. That's not the non-linearity non -lin non I mean here. But if you do spectroscopy with pulses and you make time delays and it's during the linear regime, you only measure the spectrum of a system. It's, it's like doing Fourier transform spectroscopy with a Michelson interferometer. It gives you the same information as a normal spectrometer. To measure transfer, you need to see energy going from somewhere to somewhere. So you need to go to a non-linear regime so that you can measure that. It's just like if you have a ultra-fast laser and you want to measure the pulse length or so, you need to look at the second harmonic autocorrelation to get that. Because if you look only at the linear, you only get information on the spectrum. And this is also in these transfer measurements. You need to go to the nonlinear response. How do you get nonlinear response? Ah, actually, if you saturate the system, you're already having a bend off. You already get nonlinear response, which, which you, we, we wouldn't call nonlinear, but it is not any more linear in the power dependence. Yeah? And then, of course, you can also have the true nonlinear responses of the system the chi 3 and all that, which is what people use to do two-dimensional spectroscopy a lot. And people do four-wave mixing. And, and, and so those are the, the contrasts you need. It's typically the chi 3 or the chi 4 but on a molecular level. So it's more the polarizability, but then the hyperpolarizability. Getting complex here. But you need, you need to get those components to get information on the ultra-fast. No. Apparently, Maria had enough questions still. And also, I think Clara also still had a question at some point or not. Yeah. Well, I did imagine only, I only imagine that. Maria had a question, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. You. So when you started your talk, so you motivated your research in terms of going through a clean planet. Yeah. Your research group is embedded into a clean planet yeah. research. So um, can you tell us how all this is going to help us to get a cleaner planet, Nick? That's a very difficult question. Because <laughs> at the moment, it's scientific insight into the nat natural system. And even there, we're stuck. So we're trying to understand why nature does so well. So why nature at very low light levels actually does well. At very high levels, it managed to protect itself and stay alive, which is what Nikki is a lot trying to understand. But this is very fundamental. Huh? But then if you understand nature better, you might perhaps find ways in real life, when you're working with photovoltaics and all that, to do a little bit better there. The, the tricks that nature uses to optimize between ordered and disordered systems to, to be optimal in quenching and non-quenching and transfer, nature has very clever tricks there, which are nice as a physicist to understand and to publish on and all that, but they, have, they give us insight that might help for the design of man-made solar systems, probably. Nikki might tell us, well, if you grow crops and you understand photosynthesis, you might know how to change the crop and get more efficient and grow better at lower sunlight so you have more people that can eat. 
that's also something that you might think of. Yeah? But true, calling it clean planet, planet is a nice word. We're just doing science here mainly. Yeah? That's also why I called it lessons for physicists. Yes. Thank you.